Thanks, Pastor Chris. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie, and um, it's all so good to see all of you here um, at camp. It's really my joy to be here too. And so coming into camp, um, I have just been so encouraged by the many different people, um, by the hard work poured in by, and the love poured in by the committee. I have actually been away um, for the previous two weeks. I just got back on Saturday and I have not been able to be physically here working alongside with them. Um, it's a first time serving remotely from Christmas Island. Um, so, you know, there has been a lot of, when I hit a Wi-Fi zone, I get like a hundred WhatsApp messages. Um, and, you know, it's just so wonderful to see uh, their love. And, you know, they showed, you know, I got to witness something really special, which is, you know, their one heart and their one mind working together, shouldering each other's burden with love and grace. You know, as Pastor Chris said, um, we have a children's program that is huge. We have a lot of kids. And... You know, that's the other group of people that I'm really encouraged by. You know, there are two, uh, I'll show you pictures of them. So this is the boys having their lunch, being cheeky as per normal. Um, and these are the girls, oh, and three boys. <laughs> um, and they're, they're doing their succulent workshop. But there are two kids um, that have really encouraged me. And the first one is Jonathan. Um, Jonathan is uh, that one, the middle one. And you know, Jonathan was actually sick last week. And he was so devastated that when, you know, I guess he was told that he couldn't come to camp, otherwise he would infect everybody. Um, and he was really, really sad. So on Tuesday morning, um, we all got a surprise when we saw Jonathan walk in. I think everyone was like, are you still sick? But, you know, I think he, he wanted to join us so much that he, like, willed himself to get better. And so he's with us now. The other one is um, Katie. So Katie is the one in the pink. And Katie is 10, and before I left for CI, um, I asked Katie if she was going to come and join us for camp. And she, you know, if, if any of you have interacted with Katie, she's pretty cute and really, like, quirky. So, like, she does this eyebrow raise, and, um, you know, she said, I really hope so. And so when I got back... Um, on Sunday, I asked her, you know, are you going to camp? And so she is here. But what I found out was that, you know, every morning, um, she actually wakes up at 6 a.m. to do all her homework just so that she can be at camp with us. You know, as an adult, and, you know, I, I feel like I have so much to learn from these kids. You know, their eagerness and their joy and their keenness just to be here at camp. Family camp is truly so special. You know, it brings people from all walks of life, you know, new people. Uh, I, won't, I don't want to say old people, but seasoned people. Um, you know, and it's so amazing that the Lord would bring us all here together. Um, I want to also thank the pastoral team, pastor and you know, the team of student pastors and intern pastors for coming over here to minister to us. You know, it, it takes a lot of effort. And I'm just so thankful and grateful for the special bond that we have between Bethany and Bethel. Our first song is God's Wonderful People. And it is really, really so wonderful to be here um, to learn God's word with all of you. So can we sing our first song, God's Wonderful People? Oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry. I have to introduce my um, uh, sidekicks. No. <laughs> um, my two uh, praise singer ladies, uh, Michelle and Tab. Thank you very much for supporting me as I'm cheering by myself. Yeah. Thanks, Aldine. Thank you for your lovely singing. 
Um, so for the past six months, or six months ago, I should say, I, um, I went through some changes at work and I transitioned into a new HR role. So um, I work for a mining company um, that is based on Christmas Island and it's about 2,300 2, kilometres from Perth um, and three and a half hours away by flight. And so obviously this requires me to be um, on Christmas Island quite a bit. So for the past six months, I counted, I've actually been away half of that time. So I've actually spent three months um, on the island, um, obviously flying in and out. And this all came about when we began um, a restructuring program back in November last year. And this resulted in a lot of redundancies and retirements. And it has been challenging um, as we continue to rebuild and restructure. You know, as I am only six months into this role and um, quite green in HR, there are times when I have been really overwhelmed by the unknown, overwhelmed by the many issues that arise, um, and overwhelmed by the needs of the workforce. You know, the workforce is incredibly diverse. There's about 180 of us. And the challenges that they face are very real. You know, they have problems in family. Um, there are sicknesses. And on the island, you know, um, there are mental health challenges as well. Um, just show you a picture. So this is a picture of our mine. Um, it's very old <laughs> infrastructure. Um, and, and this is our run of mine. So this is where we put um, our product and it gets blended. And so, you know, the workforce, um, as, a, as an employer, you know, the employee's um, welfare, welfare is of utmost importance to us. And to be honest, there have been many, many times when, you know, I feel a great lack of wisdom in making the right decisions. And the last trip was actually particularly challenging, you know. Uh, I think this has been my fourth time going back over and it's been for two weeks. And, you know, I felt my mental and my physical strength just slowly exhaust. Um, but, you know, at my weakest point, I just am so thankful that, you know, even without, uh, obviously, Bethel and having a church there, you know, I have the Lord's word. And, you know, that was really the only thing that kept me going. It says in Psalm 119, in verse 28, strengthen me according to your word. You know, it was really only through his word, you know. And of course, you know, thank goodness, I am very, very blessed to have my brother also be my pastor. So, you know, it's very, you know, I feel very blessed to be able to just call him. But, you know, the Lord's word, it's the strength that I found in his word, you know, just kept me going. And it, it the issues that I faced did not completely overwhelm me, you know. Even though they continued to come up and continue to arise, you know, I could face it with greater assurance that these challenges, um, in these challenges, you know, there are so many lessons to be learnt. You know, this probably isn't unique just to me. We all have our own challenges. And, you know, God's word is just so necessary for us to be able to cope with life's challenges. My next song is, His Strength is Perfect. And this song perfectly describes, you know, what a wonderful an amazing God we have, you know, in one in whom we can find our strength, one in whom we can find our strength to live triumphantly. So can we please sing our next song, His Strength is Perfect. So on Monday night, Pastor spoke about how our way of life is often what hinders us from loving God's word. And that the love for God's word should be our way of life. You know, 
and that it is not just a feeling, but that it must be cultivated over time. And last night, he spoke of how only until we put God as our priority will we be able to experience the exuberance of love for God's word that the psalmist experienced. You know, I'm so thankful that um, for the word that is given, that it cuts straight to the heart, you know, that this word made me check and examine whether I am prioritizing the Lord as I should. You know, as work and responsibilities grow, you know, even more the need to be conscious of, the, of my time spent with the Lord. You know, it is really a blessing to be able to be in these sessions and to learn the vital lessons of what it means and what it takes to love the Word of God. You know, I know my heart needs to be constantly um, cleansed and constantly renewed. So my, my last song for tonight is entitled, um, Teach Me Thy Word, O Lord. And in Psalm 119, verse 26 to 27, it says, Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts. You know, this is my prayer that the Lord would continue to teach me, that he would continue to help me to understand and that he would open my heart so that I am willing to learn um, from him. You know, and I hope that tonight as we hear his word, that you would also, that that would also be your prayer, that the Lord would teach us his ways. Let us sing um, our last song, Teach Me Thy Way, O Lord. Thank you. Um, thanks, Tab. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks, Aldine, for playing. Pass this time to Pastor Charlie. Okay, we're going to um, take the next statement about the love of the Lord's word, the law of God. <coughs> now, tonight is a little bit more challenging, a little bit more complex. So we are going to have to concentrate a little bit so if you had too much dinner and uh, you feel a little bit tight and sleepy, be committed, pinch the person next door. <clears throat> okay, this, this is important so that you notice ahead of time, why are you pinching me? <laughs> then you may say, pastor said so, you know. And then, so for once you may blame me. <laughs> But uh, this is going to be very, very challenging, and, and I'm going to <coughs> share with you a really, really complex statement uh, about how this love of God is actually uh, practiced in, in real life. And I'm going to have to try and illustrate for you how this actually works. But it is going to take you into a study of the books of Chronicles in order to illustrate this. And it is a little bit complex, but we're going to try. Okay, There are many, many important lessons to learn along the way. So let's learn them well. Well, let's pray together. Now, Father, we pray that you will <coughs> help us to understand and appreciate your word given to us. Teach us how we may apply this truth and we pray that you will help us to keep on examining the wisdom that we have in our hearts, that love that we are supposed to have for you and your word. And we pray that you will teach us how to apply these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now um, we, we're going to take a look at this very carefully. The love of God's word was first stated 47, 48. <coughs> Remember this. And we know that it did not get acquired easily, but you need to acquire this love for God. Right? 41 to 48. Problems, difficulties, challenges, you name it, they were faced. And then finally, he said, your commandments, which I love. 
And we know that this was acquired. Okay? Number two, now he began to look at uh, 97. And you take a look at it, and he began to actually exult in God's, uh, in, in this love for God's word. It was exuberant. It was liberating. It was something that was very real on top of his head. And he was there. Now, this part is fairly easy to understand. The third part is a little bit complex. You see, sometimes we have this understanding. We've got to love everybody. Is that true? Is that not true? But we don't know. Right? And so we struggle sometimes within <coughs> our heart. How do we love everybody? Because, you know, you find it very hard to love everybody. But is this actually what God says? Now tonight we're going to look at a feature of the law, of, of this love for the law of God in a very, very special way. You know, this is, this is something that we need to look at very carefully. So this is an intricate kind of love. It is a love that comes with wisdom. This is what Paul prayed for the Philippian church. That their love may abound good, but in knowledge and in wisdom. Now this is very, very important prayer. See, there is a love, but it must be with wisdom. It <coughs> must be <coughs> with understanding. Otherwise, we would be missing the points. This is one of the hardest things to love, to do. You see, a lot of times we make into we we fall into all kinds of errors. We don't love error. We love without understanding wisdom, also error. Now, this is a kind of love that is going to take a little bit of time to explore tonight. Okay, well, let's take a look at this. First, let's, <coughs> let's look at the text. At uh, verse uh, 113, we read this. Right? Now, let's, let's look at Philippians so that we won't uh, misunderstand it. Let's look at Philippians 1 to get a little bit of a flavor of what this love is all about. What this is, this is talk, what Paul was talking about. Okay, verse uh, 9. Right? That your love may abound still more and more. Love to abound, which is good. Right? But it must be in knowledge and all discernment. Now, this is where we don't understand. We sometimes think that love is everything. But it is dangerous to love without knowledge and all discernment. Right? So the call to practice love must be considered carefully. And so sometimes when we don't understand this love that must increase with knowledge and discernment, we fall afoul of what this love is all about. Right? Now watch this very carefully because 113 to the next, this next segment here where you see a comparison and a contrast approach to help us to understand that this love must be with knowledge and all discernment. For example, we take a look. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. See? Hate, love. <coughs> comparison, contrast. You need to bear this in my 113. Okay? You are my hiding place, my shield, I hope in your word. Depart from me, evildoers. There we go. So the double-minded, the evildoers, he wants nothing to do with them. See, the problem is we confuse the two. We must love everybody. And then, those who hate evil, 
we also, we know, we don't even bother. Now, this is where it gets dangerous. Watch this very carefully. Okay? Uphold me according to your word that I may live, and then read on further. Okay? You, verse 118, you reject all those who stray from your statutes. Their deceit is falsehood. You put away all the wicked of the earth like dross. Now, so he draws from the example of, the, of God himself. What does God do with the wicked? They're considered dross. You know what dross is? Silver looks like silver. It's white color, but it's actually dross. It flakes off. Not great. Gold, dross, looks like gold. It's not. It's, it's dross. It's, it's really not good stuff. You've got to take that away. That's how they refine silver. They burn, heat it up, and then the silver comes up. And what floats up is actually dross. It's silver in color, but it's not real pure silver. It's dross. You take that away. First time. You take that away. Second time. Seven times there is dross level. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then what is left behind is pure silver. That is hard to do. This is love with knowledge and all discernment. Now we're going to see how this applies in real life in the days of the kings. Watch and see how it happens. What? Okay, very carefully. <clears throat> now, in order to understand this passage here about kings, we have to go to Deuteronomy 17 first. Okay? So in Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20, we have very clear guidelines as to uh, what the kings were supposed to do or not supposed to do. Well, let's take a look. Okay? Uh, to, to Deuteronomy 17. Let's take a look. This very carefully. Right? When you come to the land, and then you say, I will set a king over me like all the other nations. <clears throat> then the Lord said, okay, I'm going to give you some very clear words. Okay, first, it must be the king whom God chooses. Right? Uh, in verse 15. And then, watch this very carefully. What a king should not do. He should not multiply horses for himself. Otherwise, he's going to take great confidence in the power of his army. Okay, now we go on further. Okay, now you shall not uh, multiply wives for himself. <clears throat> One wife is enough. It will occupy you the rest of your life. Not only good times, but bad times. Right? Heartaches, headaches, all come with wives. This is why you don't know what to do with them, don't know what to do without them. So if you have multiple wives, you are multiplying headaches and heartaches. So be wise. Don't do that. Now, that's very clear. Right? But let's take a look further. And then we read. Otherwise, the danger, his heart will be turned away. Then don't multiply silver and gold for himself as well. Now, what not to do? Right? Now, what to do? He will make a copy of this book and he shall read it every day for the rest of his life. The Word of God. Right? Now, this is absolutely important for us to understand. Now, so this is just generally uh, the guidelines. Now we turn to two chronicles. Okay, so I'm just going to try to help summarize some of these things for you. Now, so this is very clear, what not to do <clears throat> and what's to do. Okay, one, wives, don't multiply. 
Don't do mathematics. Don't add also. Okay? One is enough. Don't, don't multiply. Don't add. Don't, don't subtract either. You cannot kill also. You cannot. You just stay with one. That, that's, that's the wisest thing to do. Okay? Don't multiply horses. Don't multiply silver or gold. Just stay where you are. Now, the Word of God. Copy, read. None of the kings ever did that. Not one person. They did faithfully and diligently. Now, we'll see what happens. Okay, let's turn now to uh, David. But the only person who did it, but not <clears throat> totally, not 100%, was David. So we have, we call this the united monarchy. Okay? Uh, David king, Solomon king, that's it. Right? Now, then we have what we call the divided monarchy. Right? Israel in the north, ten tribes, plus one and a half, about eleven. Israel, Judah in the south, one tribe, plus Benjamin, half tribe. Now we're going to focus tonight on the so-called good kings. Right? As far as Israel was concerned, from the man called Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, mother with widow, from here onwards, all went south. Everything went off. They became an idolatrous nation completely from day one. From the first king to the last king, everyone was bad. That's it. Right? But let's try and see what happens here. Is there any hope for Judah? But let's look at some of the kings. So we're going to take a look at some of the kings who were there. You've got to read this for yourself. And you become very clear. Now bear in mind 113. Right? This is love for God's word, but with wisdom and discernment. What do we do with the wicked? What do we do with those who are evildoers, wrongdoers? Now, wisdom, love for God's word must teach us something very carefully because the dangers are so real. Right? Let's take a look at the notes first and then we'll take a look also at the other aspects. Okay? Um, this is important. Right? This is an important. You got to ask yourself the contrast and comparison. Do we understand this? Okay? Double minded, false way. Instead, love your law, love your testimonies. Okay? Compare, contrast. Evil doers depart, commandment kept. Okay? How about God's view? Those who stray, those who are deceitful, those who are false, those who are wicked, the Lord has nothing to do with them. That is real love for God's Word. It is balanced with wisdom and discernment. The kind of love that says everybody, including all the wicked and all the bad and all the deceitful, places you in grave, grave danger. And the danger is not only to you, but to your generations to come. That is how dangerous it gets. Well, let's take a look now at uh, 2 Chronicles. Okay, well, let's take a look at this here and we will see him. Now, Rehoboam was not a very wise king. Solomon was wise. He was otherwise. Really? Now, Solomon taxed the people like crazy to build all those palaces for his hundred wives. Right? And, and all, all the others be in between. Right? Now, where is the money going to come from? 
the people. He would tax them like crazy. So Rehoboam came up and he told the people, you think my, my father is fierce, I'm worse. And I am going to extort even more money from you. So the people said, we reject you. And so the kingdom was split. Now Rehoboam, for a while, began to try to establish whatever he had. And that was Judah. Right? And the Lord protected it for a while. Now watch the next king after Rehoboam. Right? So chapter 12, 2 Chronicles, we read, He was 41 years old, he became king, and he reigned 17 years. Right? So chapter 12, and then we read, 17 years, and then um, he passed on. Right? And in verse and he did evil. He did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord, to seek the Lord. 17 years to 12, 13. He did not seek the Lord. In his foolishness, he did not seek the Lord. Deuteronomy 17. You should make a copy of the Lord's word, read it every day of your life. Did he do that? Nope, he did not. And he ended up with evil. And he lost the kingdom completely. Right? So that love for the Lord's law must be there first, established. You've got to acquire it. It's got to be exuberant. It's got to be with wisdom and discernment. Otherwise, you can lose it. So did Rehoboam have this kind of love and wisdom? Answer, no. Chapter 13 now. Okay, so we take a look at this thing here, and this was the next king. The next king was Abijah, and he reigned in Judah. And, you know, there was war between the two of them, the two nations. So Judah and Israel, we call this an internecine war. They fought against each other, brother against brother, and they fought really badly. Many people lost their lives. Right? So this is where we take a 2 Chronicles chapter 13. And they cried out. Abijah and his people struck them with a great slaughter. 500,000 choice men died in this battle. So Rehoboam, Abijah, this is Israel, reign of Jeroboam, 500,000 people died. Remember, these were cousins. All of them were related. Somewhere along the line, they were uncles, they were aunties, they were, this is why we call it an internecine war. Same. America, north and south. Thousands upon thousands died. What happened? Where is that wisdom? Where is the word of God? Where is that love for the Lord's word? They went to war. So you, in war, somebody's got to win, somebody's got to lose. Ask yourself, at what expense? You are prepared to share the lives of 500,000 people. What kind of wisdom is that? What kind of love for God's law is that? See, it is a love, as it were, for the Lord's law and everything else in name at the expense of 500,000 lives. And that is something that cannot be easily repaired. Well, let's take a look. Okay? Now, he only reigned three years. Verse 21. He married 14 wives. Three years. 14 divided by three. Are you crazy or something? So every year he marries a few. If we put 15, it's easier. Huh? About. One year, five wives. For what? 
Perpetual has a hard time to remember all the wives' names. And he's got to celebrate 14 wives, 14 birthdays, 14 anniversaries. No wonder he died three years later. <laughs> Look at this crazy child. How stupid can you be? Look, look at how many children he had, right? And he had 22 sons and 16 daughters. 22 and 16. Why are you doing such mathematics? 38. So you don't have enough months in the year to celebrate their birthdays. Every month is a birthday of somebody. Every other month, the anniversary of somebody. <sighs> Don't multiply wives. You won't live very long. <laughs> you got to be kidding. All right, so now that is something you need to take a look at, right? So learn, young man, learn. Don't go to all this nonsense. Uh, okay, so be wise upon this matter. Let's go on further. So he, d was, he rested with his fathers and they buried him and his son reigned in his place. Now, this man was a little bit better. Okay, so Rehoboam, so Abijah was there and he is a cameraman. His name was called ASA. Right? Abijah, A-S-A. Nobody takes photographs here. His name was called Asa. Never mind. <laughs> they don't have cameras in those days. And he reigned for about 41 years. He had pretty good reign. He began so well. Let's take a look at what he did when he began so well. So many good things. He did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord, his God. Good. Okay? Two, he removed the altars of the foreign gods and the high places, and broke down the sacred pillars, and so on and so forth. Good. Who started all that? Solomon. Right? So, began to take now. Pretty good. Now, he went on further. You see, he commanded Judah to seek the Lord God. Remove the high places, incense altars, built fortified cities in Judah, and so and so forth. And he had an army of 300,000 from Judah, and then 280,000 men. So half a million people. That's a pretty good sized army. What is the size of the army of Australia? I can tell you, it's much less than that. Right? You don't even have 100,000 soldiers, actually. Because UK has only about 72,000. Australia is very expensive, so, we, so they had 500,000 men. Then came the Ethiopians. The Ethiopians came to attack them. Look at chapter 14. Right? So Zerah the Ethiopian came out against them with an army of 1 million men and 300 chariots. That's a lot of people. So now we are looking at one million. So they're about twice as much. Right? Now, it's going to be very hard to defeat an enemy that size. And the Ethiopian guys were big, and they were strong, and they were difficult to defeat. So what did they do? <clears throat> very wisely, right? They cried out to the Lord, verse uh, 11, cried out to the Lord, Lord, it is nothing for you to help. Whether with many or with those who have no power, help us, O Lord God. We rest on you. In your name we go against a multitude. And the Lord struck the Egyptians, or Ethiopians. That's the best person to have on your side, the Lord. And so they won a great victory. Right? And uh, they could not recover because the Lord himself broke them and his army. And so they carried away much spoil. And then we read in chapter 15, The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa. And he said, Hear me, Asa, all Judah and Benjamin. Okay, the Lord is with you. You are with him. 
If you seek him, he will be found by you. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. How much clearer can you get? Be strong. Do not let your hands be weak. Verse 7. And so Asa heard these words, very encouraged. He carried on doing something that is good. He even made a covenant. We must seek the Lord God. Now in chapter 16. Now this was a begin of, beginning of his downfall. Now remember, his enemy was, was uh, the Ethiop Ethiopia. One million strong army. And then came, look, Israel, the northern part of it. Remember, there were already 500,000 people destroyed before. So they came with an army. Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah, built Ramah that he cannot get in or cannot get out. The most foolish thing. Asa went to look for help. Against Ethiopia, he cried out to the Lord for help. But this time, he did not cry out for help. He went to Syria. Come and help me. <coughs> Look, I'll take temple treasures and give you. Right? How about that? And Syria came. Okay, I'll help you. We will uh, whack uh, Israel. Now, at that time, Hanani, the seer, he came along and he said to him, you have, because you have relied on the king of Syria, you have not relied on the Lord your God. Right? So this is what happened. The Ethiopian and the Lubim, a huge army, many chariots, you relied on the Lord, he delivered them. Because the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout uh, the whole earth. You have done foolishly. From now onward, you shall have wars. And you know, Asa was angry with the seer. Why you dare to tell me this? I am the king. I do whatever I want. Go to jail. So he arrested and put Hanani, the seer, into jail. What happened? Foolishly. That wisdom, the discernment was not there. The initial love for God, covenants, worship the Lord, take away the idols, were now replaced with a broken system of wisdom from human beings. The army of Israel was nothing close to the army of Ethiopia. For some stupid reason, he went to fear them instead. But what happened? Anger, pride, foolishness combined together. And so he jailed the prophet Hanani instead. And then see what happened. Okay? And then he was enraged. He oppressed the people. In other words, there were some people who cited the prophet. He oppressed them. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet. His malady was severe, but in his, in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. In the 41st year, he died, disease-ridden. What happened? That love for the Lord, compromise, lost, gone. First example of what happens when we compromise like that. Right? Now, we go on to the next king. Asa, the next king. The next king was King Jehoshaphat. Now, we're going to focus a little bit on him tonight because his role is very, very important. So, King Jehoshaphat went and his son reigned and he strengthened himself against Israel. Right? Now watch. His enemy was, first he strengthened himself against Israel, northern. Okay? Well and good, you're protecting your country. Now, what happened was, happened here. In the third year of his reign, 
Okay, now we go on further. The fear of the Lord was felt in the kingdom and he became increasingly powerful. Verse 12. And so he had a lot of... Um, the uh, Judah, 300,000 mighty men of valor. Next to him, 280,000. Next to him, 200,000. Another 200,000. Another one, 180,000. That is a huge army. 300,000, 200,000, 200,000, 100 over 1,000. That's a huge army. So he strengthened himself. He became increasingly powerful. Well and good. Watch. Chapter 18. All right? He had riches and honor in abundance. And by marriage, he allied himself with Ahab. Now, who on earth is this person called Ahab? Now, if you are looking for a name of a son... <laughs> Try not to call him Ahab. Look at this. Now, so he said, okay, son, this is Ahab, northern kingdom, right? I have fortified myself against Israel. And then suddenly he makes a marriage alliance with this Ahab has a wife called Jezebel. Ladies, try not to call yourself by that name. This is a very serious name. It is not under the popular name of the most popular name in America. You can be very sure. Neither Ahab. And this lady is, I mean, she is really wicked. If Ahab is wicked, is only spelled with wicked. Wife is spelled W, wicked. This is wife, Jezebel, a really powerful, fierce lady. Right? Now, of all things, made an alliance with him. What's wrong? What's the problem? See? Now, so he went on further. Let's, let's look. It looks, looks very innocent. So very stupid. It is what he said. So he said, after some years, he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria. One moment, I am fortified with more than half a million soldiers against you. Next moment, I come and say hello to you. So Ahab, he's a very clever fellow. So he went on there, and uh, Ahab killed sheep and oxen, lamb on rack there, Rack of lamb there, plus oxen, whatever you, what you beef, whatever. Was there all in abundance for him and his people were with him. Persuaded him. Well, let's go. So Ahab, king of Israel, said to him, Will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? Small army. So he said, listen to these words. I am as you are. My people are your people. We will be with you in the way. Are you serious? One moment you build an army against them. The years of war forgotten. So now we are great people, friends. Your people, my people. Where you go, I will be there with you. Are you serious? So he went. <clears throat> Right? And so, of course, a uh, warning was given by Micaiah the prophet. Ahab dies in battle. All right, now chapter 19. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returns safely to his house in Jerusalem. In that battle, Jehoshaphat nearly died. The hundreds of thousands of soldiers could not protect him. It was God who protected him, and he didn't realize it. Right? Now, let's take a look at his battle. Maybe you don't know this battle. Chapter 18, let's take a look at his battle. Would you go and fight with me, uh, Ramoth Gilead? Okay, so there we go. And, and, and right? 
So um, there it is. Now take a look, and then we look at chapter <coughs> 20, uh, 1828. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat went up to Ramoth Gilead to fight the enemy. Okay, and so um, the king said, "I said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself, go into battle. You put on your robes." So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. So the king of Syria uh, commanded the captain of the chariots there, fight with no one except with the king of Israel. So it was when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, it is the king of Israel. So they surrounded him to attack. And Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him and diverted them from him. He could have died. They targeted. In other words, this guy himself. Okay, you wear my robes, I wear your robes. How about that? Wow, this one king of Israel. Shroom, to attack nobody except him. He nearly died. Cry, Lord, help! In those kind of situations, only one word prayer is enough. The word is help! And the Lord delivered him mercifully. He could have died. So here is Ahab, this guy himself. Okay? And uh, there it was. So they didn't, so they, they didn't uh, pursue him. Now a certain man drew a bow at random. So he shot an arrow into the air. Where it landed, he would, did not know where. So he pulled the bow, shot the arrow into the air, into the air and there it is. And whom did he hit? Ahab. This arrow had Ahab's name. He just didn't know it. Shoot it into the air. We don't know where Ahab is. And lo and behold, just like the stone that killed Goliath, this arrow found its mark. And it went to Ahab and he died. Now, okay, that's over, right? That's over. Let's take a look further. Chapter 19, he came back, Jehu, the son of Hanani. Jehu, the son of Hanani, the son of Hanani was the one jailed by King Asa. Now the son comes in and he talks to a, a Jehoshaphat and he asks him one question. Should you help the wicked? Should you love those who hate the Lord? Yeah. Now, see? Psalm 119. You say you love the Lord. You take down the altars and so and so forth. But you have learned to love the wicked. This kind of love is useless. It's dangerous. And he was rebuked by Jehu, the uh, son of Hanani. Right? Good things have been found in you. All right? So uh, you are spared. And so there we go. And chapter um, 19. Right? So the Lord was there, merciful to him. Now, chapter 20, he reigned for 25 years. Right? Now, let's take a look at this. And then he died. Now, you think, well, he's foolish. Okay, he died. End of story. Nope. Life goes on. He's king. Jehoshaphat. Next one is Jehoram. Right? Take a look at Jehoram. And he was there. And Jehoram reigned in his place. Chapter 21. He had brothers. The sons of Jehoshaphat. Alright? And then some of them were named. The father gave them great gifts of silver and gold and precious things and fortified cities. But he gave the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Now, when Jehoram was established over the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself. Guess what he did? He killed all his brothers. What happened here? Ha! 
how did he end up killing his own brothers? Now watch what happened. A description was, uh, explanation was given. He was 32 years old. Now he's not a young man then. He's already grown up. He became king. He reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Just as the house of Ahab had done. He had become an idolater. What happened? Watch very clearly. Right? Now, he, for he had the daughter of Ahab as wife. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Who was his wife? Athaliah. Who was she? Daughter of Ahab. She was the one who told him, you want to be secure as king, you must do this. Kill everyone. So he set his own hand against his own brothers. He had not learned how to distinguish between good and evil. He had not learned to distinguish between what is good in the sight of the Lord and what is evil. He did not put away all the evil. Instead, he embraced evil. And now, Judah was going to go into idolatry big time. Now, we go on further. Not only did he do that, we read this. Okay? So, well, the Lord sent in people. Um, the Edomites revolted. Libna revolted. The uh, Philistines revolt, revolted. The Arabians revolted. So there were now four enemies. Four sets of enemies. What would you do with them? Well, this became a real problem. Now, here is interesting. Because in 21, in verse 12, Elijah is not known as a writing prophet. <coughs> it doesn't mean he doesn't know how to write. And he wrote this letter to the king. And this is what he said. Thus says the Lord God of your father David. One, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat your father. Okay? nor in the ways of Asa, king of Judah, even though he was not very good. You have walked in the way of the kings of Israel, right? And have made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot. You have killed your brothers. Those of your father's household, they were better than yourself. Behold, the Lord will strike your people with a serious affliction. Your children, your wives, all your possessions, you will become very sick with the, disease, with the disease of your intestines. And you will die. Look at the compromise. Right? So from Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, the sin of the father, is now upon this child. Now he kills all his other sons. Why? He did not learn how to love the Lord with wisdom and discernment. He compromised himself so badly. The children, his son, was there. You think this is bad enough? So then he died. Diseased. Asa, diseased feet. This one, diseased intestines. What happens now? Athaliah takes over. Watch. She becomes the queen. Take a look very carefully. Right? And so um, we read verse 17, 21 17. And they came up into Judah, the enemies, the Arabians, the Philistines, and others. They took away all the possessions that were found in the king's house. 
also his sons and his wives, so that there was not a son left to him except Jehoahaz. So only one son was left, Jehoahaz. Right? Watch what happens. Now all the Lord and all that, all this, after all this, the Lord struck him in the intestines with an incurable disease. In the course of time, after the end of two years, his intestines came out because of his sickness. And he died in severe pain. Eight years of terror. What happened? One simple act. Jehoshaphat married him away to Athaliah. She came in, brought the evil influence His own brothers died. His own sons were taken away captive and died because of compromise. Now that is severe. And the story gets worse. It doesn't stop. Look at how it goes. 22. Now, this fellow called Ahaziah, which is the same and another name as Jehoahaz, 22, uh, 1 and 21, 17, the same king, Okay, we read, the raiders who came from with the Arabians to the camp killed all the older sons. Right, so Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, he was 42 years, reigned one year. His mother's name was Athaliah. This lady was brought in. This woman was brought in by Jehoshaphat. She now reigns as queen mother because Husband had died. This younger son was the only one left, she thinks. And she has a reign of terror. Watch what happens over here. Okay? Now she came in, and we see this. He walked in the ways of the house of Ahab. His mother advised him to do wickedly. Because the mother thinks wickedness is good. Teaches the son to do wickedly. His king. So he does wickedly. Watch what else he did. Right? And so they were his counselors. After the death of his father to his destruction, he followed their advice, went with Jehoram to attack uh, Hetzel, king of Syria in Ramoth Gilead, the Syrians. The Syrians wounded Joram. He returned there to, and, and so his going to Joram was God's occasion for Ahaziah's downfall. Right? So there he was, and then he was killed. Now, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. The reign of terror went on. Anybody related to the royal family will be killed. And all because of one man, Jehoshaphat. Compromise with Ahab. Got his son married to Athaliah. The son was the offspring down there, killed his own brothers. His other son went on to follow the mother's advice, do wickedly. After he died, as if the mother cared, the mother took over. Anybody related to the Judah family, David's family, died. Reign of terror. In God's mercy, only one king survived, Joash. You see, this is Satan's work. If they can destroy everyone, the line of David would be stopped. The Messiah cannot come. This is evil in the worst possible way. And you disguise it under marriage. See, we all do the same thing. You want to marry? Never mind, get married. Doesn't matter who, get married. Watch the offspring. They won't come to church. 
you lost a generation because we did not know how to say no. We compromise. Watch the children. We are losing them left, right, center. You don't have to do wicked things. You don't have to worship idols. All you need to do is to compromise. Jehoshaphat did that. Should you help? Should you love the wicked? Should you help the ungodly? Jehu, son of Hanani. And you know, after a while, we make all kinds of excuses. It's okay. And our children will go astray. And we will lose our grandchildren. And we are going to lose even worse. Because we didn't have the wisdom and that love for God and His Word to prevent us from doing these stupid things we do. Look at this. One person, two generations down, suffered because of him. Lives of whole families, all the sons, all the cousins, all the people died except one person was saved alive. This is how it works with compromise. And you read this story and it is frightening to note. And we all compromise. We make excuses. We say it's all right. You know, all things will work together for good. We kid ourselves. We deceive ourselves. This is broken systems. This is a lack of wisdom. This is a lack of knowledge of God's word. Clearly, copy this law for yourself. Read it day and night. Learn to love the Lord. Learn to place Him first in your life. Nothing was obeyed. That's what we're seeing today. Left, right, center, compromise. What do we do now? You know, you can't even unwind. You cannot rewrite history. We now only have to do whatever we can. We salvage whatever we can. We keep whatever we can and we do it. Please, and I'm going to urge you, we don't bring up our children to love the Lord. They are going the way of the world. We are going to lose them. And there is no mistaking this, this reality. This is why we need to learn how to love the Lord at His law. We need to hide the Lord's word, otherwise we are sunk. Now this is something that we need to think about very, very carefully. Right? And that's why the psalmist talks about it. That how he needs to fear the Lord, afraid of God's judgment. How do we, how can we speak of love for the Lord's law if we also love wickedness, we also love the way of darkness, we walk in the way of sin. How can we do that? Now I've written a little poem. This is very important. I want to share this with you. <clears throat> Learning to love the Lord is a delicate art. It's not straightforward. We need to learn to examine every part. There may be areas we have compromise without realizing our soul is jeopardized. We need to learn that we must hate sin. It corrupts us from without and within. The Word must cleanse us thoroughly, or sin will control our souls horribly. Strength and wisdom must be sought and found and then applied to heart and soul till we are sound. Then may we speak of a love for God's law, and we will be able to behold His word in awe. The terrible effects of sin must cause us to fear. To our precious Lord we must ever draw near. He will open our eyes to fathom the word of God. A deep and pure love can be cultivated for the Lord. If we don't do this, we are going to lose big time. Tonight, I have just shared with you 
that these are the stories of the kings of Judah. Israel in the north is all but gone completely. Whatever it is there remains. That is the nature of evil. That is the work of the evil one. And he will seek to kill, if not corrupt. At the end of it all, it's the same. We lose ground. You want to have a love for the Lord's word? Then learn how he can compare, contrast. Do you also hate evil? Because if we learn how to love, we say we speak of love for the Lord and we've compromised with evil. We don't really love the Lord. We place our soul in jeopardy. And tonight, we all recognize this. It's true in our life. And while we still have hope, if our children are still young, then it is wise for us to advise them very strongly. That we cannot compromise our faith. We cannot compromise the Word of God. We cannot compromise with anything but is it darkness and sin? Or we will bring tragedy to ourselves, individually, to our family, to the next generation. <coughs> That's why the Lord said, to the third and the fourth generation. And they will suffer because of us. Tonight, let's take heed. Really take heed. You really want to talk about the love for the Lord and His Word, then let us do it correctly. Let's do it wisely. Let's do it according to the Lord's Word. How I hate the double minded, those who are evil, those who are wicked. And then can we speak of love for God's Word? Because you cannot love both. Now ask yourself how have we learned how to love the Lord? First, acquisition. Second, exuberance. Third, wisdom. That is necessary in a cultivation of the love for God's Word. Nothing less than that. Think about this. Okay? Well, let's pray together. <clears throat> tonight, as we pray together, then I realize that tonight we are touching on a very serious word. <coughs> you know, one of the reasons why we don't have a love for God's Word is because we have compromised left, right, center. We can't even distinguish between right and wrong. We've compromised with our children's lives. We've compromised with our, the things we say and do. We have compromised and badly. You know, you can't see it right now. It will be seen later, too late in our children. Worse, in our children's children. And tonight I urge you, please bring everything to the Lord in prayer. You cannot compromise good and evil. You just can't. And so, Jehoshaphat began so well. He didn't do too many things bad. All you need is one mistake like this. He married his son to Ahab's family. And a tragedy would be that he will lose his sons and his grandsons and everybody of his family was nearly wiped out because of one foolish act of compromise. Now you ask yourself, how serious is that sin? And you realize how serious that sin is. See, we all compromise left, right, center. <clears throat> and we shouldn't. Tonight, let's seek the Lord for forgiveness. 
Now, there aren't too many things we can undo because it's already done. What remains is that we must not lose any more ground. We must hold fast. If you don't have a love for God's word acquired, if that is not exuberant, it has not been developed, develop it. Now guard the word of God from compromise. Do it with wisdom and discernment. Absolutely vital. For our own sake, our children's sake, grandchildren's sake, for the church's sake, cry out to God, pray that God will grant us His mercy and prevent us from making further worse mistakes. Think about this. Our Father, we pray tonight for our eyes to be open, to realize how dangerous it is to compromise. And Father, we have compromised. We have compromised our children and the spouses that they have taken, and we are in danger of losing our grandchildren. And we know this right well. Father, forgive us when we don't grieve. Forgive us when we do not weep before you because of our many sins. Tonight we ask you to do a new work within us. Open our eyes to understand the danger of the sin of compromise. And we pray that you will teach us how we can walk before you aright. Grant us your mercy and, and grace, we pray, that we may preserve what you have given to us. Lord, we pray for mercy for our children, our grandchildren. And we ask that you will grant us this, our plea, that you will spare us. And so we pray that you will hear this, our prayer tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.